Amen. Praise the Lord. He's good. Amen. Amen. He is awesome. Well, good to see you this morning. We're on cloud nine. We just got back from a great marriage retreat this first weekend. It was a praise the Lord and just got a good turnout and great weather and just got to meet with God. And it was just wonderful, marvelous. People went there glad that they just got to invest in their marriages. And Brother Jimmy will be telling us at the end of the service about our next one coming up this weekend. And so it's just going to be another great time in the Lord. And we praise the Lord for His goodness. We give Him all the glory for everything that happens, everything that's done, and everything that's accomplished. Amen. Well, Pierre kind of got in trouble. Pierre uh, broke into some drug dealer's house and uh, stole about $3 million. And uh, he thought he was going to live very well. And uh, he took that money and went back home to where he lived in France and uh, was living pretty good until the drug dealers got a wind of where he was. And so they flew to France and found him, located him in his little cabin in the woods where he was hiding out. And so they got him out of the cabin. Of course, they had all their machine guns and everything ready. And of course, he didn't speak English and they didn't speak French. So he happened to have a friend there that was there in the cabin with him that spoke both English and French. And so the drug dealers all had their guns aimed at him and they said, Pierre, if you don't tell us where that $3 million is that you stole from us, we're going to blast you full of holes. So they told the interpreter, tell him that. So he told him that in French, you know. So Pierre answered back to the interpreter, okay, okay. Tell them it's back behind the well the first tree behind it, underneath that rock, that's where it's all hid. So the interpreter tells the gang members, he said, blast away. <laughs> Some things don't turn out in life just like we want them to, do they? They're many times to our worse and not to our better. And I don't see the clicker up here, so somebody's going to have to bring that up here to me. So anyway... Uh, if we can go to that sermon slide too, we can get that. So anyway, some things don't occur for the good. They seem like they're occurring for not so good. Amen. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, our first verse, thank you, is in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Many of you don't need to turn there because you've not only memorized it, you've told other people this, that we know that God causes all things to work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. And you've told people that before. You know, they're going through hardship. And you say, don't worry about it. All things are working together for good. You know, and you know, you've know, you said it, you've quoted it. But a lot of people uh, kind of don't, don't misquote it. And they just stop too early and don't know that, that it only applies to those that love God and those that are called according to His purpose. Now, those who are called according to His purpose, we believe, are the saved. And of course, that's saved people, His purpose, to, to be saved. And then those who love Him can also be that, but I believe that's a little more because Jesus said clearly who loved Him. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. A lot of people are in sin saying, I love God. You know, they're in rebellion. I love God. You know, they're not obeying any portion of His command. I love God. They got certain commandments they refused to obey. I love God. And Jesus said, no, no, no. You've got your own definition of love. My definition is the only definition that matters. And I say, if you love me, you keep my commandments. That's how you show that you love me. And so I believe both of these apply to that, that yes, if we're saved and we're obeying God, then I believe all things will work together for good because God's word said it. And that settles everything right there. Now, so, the deal is, it says it works together for good. And of course, when we're going through good times, that seems like it is all working together for good. But what about when we're going through bad times? Well, that's when we look at this statement. Well, what about when the for good doesn't look good? I mean, it may be for good, but right now it don't look good. So how can the not looking good be for good? If it's going to be good. Does that sound good? Well, that's, that's what it is. 
You know, we got enough. Now, some of you out there, you know, you, we've, we go through negative, difficult, hard situations at times. And some of us are in those times now. And some of you, I can see from the expression on your face, are not. But hang on. Just hang on. Save, these mess- save this message, write it down, and, you know. And if you've got a way to avoid all negative, difficult situations, I'll sit down out there, you come up here and you tell us how to do it to avoid all negative situations. I'd rather take your notes than you take mine because I'd rather avoid them than go through them. I'm not a masochist that says, man, I look forward to bad times, difficult times, trying times, suffering times. Nobody likes that, but they're going to come and how we deal with them is what's going to matter because many times that for good in our life sure doesn't look good. So let's look at that verse a little closer and look at that word work together. That's the key word to understanding this passage because it's the Greek word uh, sunergeo, which has to do with, yes, working together to be partners in labor. Those things that are in our life partner together to work something out. Matter of fact, the... uh, What's where we get our English word from that Greek word, synergism, which the dictionary defines the word synergism as this, an action of two or more substances, organs, or organisms to achieve an effect of which each individually is incapable. So synergism is, if I take this product and I want it to accomplish this, it cannot. It's unable to do that. This object cannot accomplish this effect. This object can't accomplish this effect. This object can't accomplish this effect. But if I combine them all, all three of them together in one substance together can accomplish that purpose. So if the Bible is saying in this word, if these things for the believer and the one who are obeying his commandments can let all these negative things come together, they will work out together for good. They don't look good, but they will be good on our behalf. Now, I don't like, know about you or, or, or I, I like chocolate cake. I see a lot of amens there. First amen this morning. But uh, anyway, but I don't necessarily like the ingredients of cake separately. You know, Rebecca doesn't call me and said, hey, we got raw eggs. Come and get it. You know, hey, get your milk. I got your cup of flour ready for you to eat. Ooh, yummy, yummy, yummy. Cup of flour. Here's a cup of sugar. You know, as much as good sweets, uh, just eating a cup of sugar doesn't do too much, you know. Hey, we've got a little vegetable. You hungry? No, I'm not that hungry. But you take those bad boys and work them together, mix them up, synergize them, synergize them, blend them, mix them, and then put them in heat, hot trial, difficulty in that oven at the right temperature, and pull that bad boy out, put a little icing on there, And now you can call me to get some of those independent, separate ingredients that are all mixed together, that came out together for good. Can I get an amen? That's good stuff, but it had to be mixed, worked together, synergio, and put in heat and difficulty. How much heat? Probably around 350. You go too little, heat, the chef would say it's going to come out doughy and gooey and no good. You'd get too much heat, it may be burned. You may be saying, how long do I have to stay in this difficult situation? Well, how long does that cake need to stay in that oven to be good and sweet to everybody who's going to eat it? I don't know. Ask the chef, the master chef. He knows how long that needs to stay in that oven. If it comes out too early, that stuff's mushy and gooey and no good. If it stays in too long, it's burnt and that's no good. And our master chef knows how hot to make your trial and how long that we got to stay in it for it to be just what it needs to be for good and to come together and to make life what he wants it to be for us. And so within that, we've got to find out 
what it is that makes the Christian's life the life that it needs to be when we go through trials. And Peter called the trials fiery. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Hey, as though some strange thing happened. Oh, what's this? Me, a Christian, and bad stuff happening? And you get shocked and surprised and saying, wow, where'd this thing came from? Or where'd it come from? And in here, it shouldn't be a shock and it should be looked at as just like that cake. You had to get in the oven, the fire, the fire of trials. And I think if we look, probably no other person exempts this type of situation more than the life of Joseph who went through the fiery trials. And what we need to learn about being in trials, I think we need to learn from the life of Joseph. Now, if you're going through a trial, you're probably anxiously ready to write this down. And then you'll wish you'd wrote it down when next week, next month or whatever, you're in a trial and you're thinking, oh, wow, I wonder what that, wonder what I ought to be doing in the midst of this difficulty. Now, you know the story of Joseph. Life was pretty good. He was the favorite son of his dad and his dad did play favorites and that's not the topic of today's sermon but never play favorites. This whole story went south because one dad decided to play favorites with one son and that should never be the case. We should love our children equally. There may be times when we show them particular elevation because they're going through a particular achievement and you show that but I mean overall your children should look overall over the whole year my Parents treat me, treat us all about equal. But that's not the reason we're using this message. But that's what happened. The other brothers became so jealous of the way their dad was treating one of them and not the other 11. So that jealousy came in immense amount. Plus he added on that, giving him a coat of many colors to add on that. And he didn't give the other brothers a coat of many colors and so all of this began to stir and so you know the story they were out tending the flock and Joseph comes out to look out on them and then they see him coming and they think hey we can kill him and that'll solve that problem their jealousy was so bad they wanted to kill their own brother and then at that moment they see uh, after they grabbed Joseph and threw him in a pit to eventually kill him. They see an Ishmaelite group of traitors coming by and they thought, hey, let's don't kill him. Let's, uh, let's sell him. So they change their mind and they take their brother, they get the robe off of him, you know the story, and then they sell him to these Ishmaelites for an amount of money. And off he goes into slavery. Wow, how can anybody be that mean to somebody? This is even their own kinfolk that they would be that mean and jealous and hateful. But what what Joseph did in the midst of this fire is what we should all do in the midst of our difficulty, no matter how big the fire is or how little, these lessons we should learn, and I think Joseph learned them as he went. He learned the Lord was with him in the fire. He was with him in the fire. We know that he ends up being a slave in Potiphar's house. And in that house, we see that he had to go through difficulty. So now he's a slave. He's a slave in Potiphar's house. And the Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. You see, now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord had caused him to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer of his house. And all that he owned, he put in his charge. Later on, we'll see as we get to that part of the story, he gets thrown into prison, but even in prison. And the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor. You know, when we're in difficult situations, we wonder how long it's going to be and what's going to happen and how's it going to turn out. And about the only comfort we can bring somebody is to say, I don't know, but all I can guarantee you is one thing, the Lord will be with you in it. Well, how long? I don't know. How hot? I don't know. How's this going to turn out? I don't know. 
But I can guarantee you, if you will follow the Lord, obey the Lord, and serve Him, you, the Lord, is going to be with you in this difficulty. Amen. And because, hey, what was maybe Joseph praying, Lord, get me out of this slavery. It didn't happen. But during and in the slavery, God was with him. And he made everything that he had prospered. That's usually people are in a trial almost like holding their breath. I'm not going to do anything for the Lord. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. But when this thing's over, I may do something. Well, no, you do something while you're in the midst of it. This is the time to shine in the midst of the darkness and to say, I don't care how it turns out, I'm serving the Lord. Because Joseph said, you know, he probably thought, you know, I may be a slave here the rest of my life. I may die in this house, and he may have. So I'm not going to wait to shine. I'm going to shine in the midst of it. And a lot of people have this deal with the Lord. Lord, if you'll work this out, then I'll do this. How about I'll do this, and Lord, please work it out. <laughs> How about putting our commitment before what we need of the Lord. Why don't we just shine and be what God wants us to be in the midst of our difficulty? And Joseph did just that. And in your trial and in your difficulty, you may not have anything to turn to except this one statement. Put your name in that. And the Lord was with and put your name and hang on to that and walk you through the trial with just that hope. God is with me in the midst of it because it may seem like God's nowhere near. Joseph could have thought that. Joseph could have thought, where is God now? I'm in slavery. I didn't do anything to deserve this slavery. My brothers did this to me. I'm following the Lord. Why doesn't he take me out of this situation? And why am I still a slave? Well, I don't know, but that's just God's plan right now for you. It may not be the plan all the time, but it's his plan right now. And so how can you have joy in the midst of difficulty? For one reason. The Lord's with me. I don't see him. Maybe I can't tell, but he is. By faith, I know he's with me. And Joseph could see some things around him to make that clear. I mean, he got in charge of everything. Everything in the, all the house of Pharaoh. And even the lost Pharaoh could see that the Lord was causing it to happen. So he was being a witness in the midst of the darkness. That was good and a good testimony. You see... You think, well, things started to get a little better. Well, they did. But sometimes they get worse. And he learned that the Lord doesn't always immediately get you out of the fire. And sometimes it gets hotter. You mean hotter when I keep disobeying? No, sometimes it gets hotter even when you're obeying. It goes from bad to worse. Now, if you're doing something you ought not be doing and it's going from bad to worse... Some, some counsel for that is stop doing that <laughs> so that you know it's not that. You know, you can X that out and say, I know it's not the Lord chastening me for doing wrong because that may be the reason you're in the trial to start with is for him to chasten you to, for you to stop that because he is a faithful dad. He's a faithful parent and every faithful parent disciplines his own children. But it may just be that you're going through this trial for God to work something else out. It may not be that Joseph was being disobedient. It doesn't say anywhere in the scripture that he is. But it still got hotter. It still got worse and not better. And a lot of people bail out here. That's where a lot of people just bail out on the Lord. So well, if he's a God like this and I'm doing all I know to do and I'm doing all I can and I'm doing all that God's asked me to do and it's still getting worse, I'm out of here. And they bail out on God. Instead of hanging in there. Now he's in Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife kind of is looking at him a little lustfully because the Bible says he was a handsome man. He's a man of form, so he was, had a great physique. And so she kind of took note of that and shows she was after him day after day after day for him to fall into immorality. But being the man of God he was, he kept saying no and no and no and no. Till eventually we see in Genesis 39, 12, and she caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. Now, Joseph could have did, done like some people doing this and say, well, let's sit down and talk. Nothing wrong with a little fellowship, a little talking with somebody from the opposite sex, a little Facebook time with the opposite sex. What's wrong with that? You say, Brother Tim, why are you so upset? Because I've seen marriages fail this way. 
I've seen people fall this way. Ain't no time to talk. Ain't no time to text. Ain't no time to Facebook. This is a married woman and you're not. And this is not your wife. And that's not your husband. There's no time for talking and texting and FaceTiming. Well, what's it time to do? Run. (laughs) Drop the phone. Drop the text. Get out of there. Flee. Run. You know, you can read all kind of books and you read all kind of seminars and you can come up with all kind of 12-step programs to be successful and free. But when it comes to sexual immorality, there's only a one-step program and it's a one-word program and it's in the Bible and the word is flee, past tense fled. Well, I think I'll do... No. Well, maybe we'll just know. Well, there's nothing wrong with text. No! Do you know what no means? No means no and it means flee. Run, go, don't have any part to do with it. And you ask a lot of people, how'd you get to that bad place in your life? I didn't flee. I didn't drop the text. I didn't drop the calls. I didn't drop the visits. I didn't drop talking. I didn't flee. You look at every single, 100% of them will say, that's where it began. It didn't begin there, it began there. What's so wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is that doesn't stop there. That will go somewhere unless you flee. You may have gone this far, then flee then. And so Joseph did the only thing that any person, well, I've been saved for 42 years. What does that matter? Okay, if you've been saved for 400 years, you've got to run. Amen. Well, I know a lot of the Bible. And I, well, good, run. That's all you can do. Uh, spiritual maturity is not the issue. All of us are weak. Now, if you're spiritually mature, then you know run faster <laughs> or quicker or sooner. You know, that means you're spiritually mature. Just don't wait. If anything's bringing your walk down, get away from it. My goodness, it doesn't take a PhD in anything. Just run. And so he does. He runs. He gets out of there. He does what he was supposed to do. And she accuses him of rape because she has her garment, his garment in her hand and shows her husband and says, he raped me. Well, he didn't. That's not what was believed. And so Joseph's master, Potiphar, took him, put him into jail. Brother Tim, that's not fair. Well, it's not, but that's what happened. Yeah, but why didn't God prevent that? Well, let's read the rest of the story. See, a lot of people think because something happened, that messes up God's plans. I don't think you heard that. Because what somebody did messed up God's plans. I was headed this way. And this person did this, or that person did this, or a government did this, or somebody messed me up in my... Whatever it is, nothing, according to Job, can thwart the plans of God. Nothing. So if you're following God and you're being obedient to God, God, nothing can mess that up. Well, that messed it up. Well, it messed it up from what you can see, but not, not, what, not what God could see. Well, if that person wouldn't have fired me or if that person wouldn't have done that or if that person wouldn't have done that and if that wouldn't have happened, I could have really been what I needed to be. No, you do what's right and God's going to work out the difference. This guy was so wrongly accused, but he held his ground. He did what was right. You think, well, he may have done better if he had went ahead and sinned. She may have just been quiet. Well, it may have, but you're supposed to do what's right and let God handle the rest. And that's what happened. but, But it got worse. He did what was right and things got worse. But for the believer, you say, hey, I'm just going to obey God. i got to leave the results to Him, but I'm going to sleep at night knowing I obeyed Him and trusted Him, and then I can claim that promise, for all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. You lay that down at night in disobedience, you might as well not quote that verse because you went in and compromised and did what you wanted to do instead of what God wanted you to do, and you're not loving God, you're one your way. And the kicker is this. When we go through these difficult times, the the answer is this. It will bring to the surface what's most important in our life. If comfort is most important, which comfort's pretty important to us all. I don't like you, I like comfort. I don't like pain, agony, suffering. I, I prefer when there's a multiple choice, I pick comfort. Real good comfort. Best comfort. Best food. Best. I mean, that's my choice. But if that's the most important thing to me and I have everything but comfort, 
then trials are going to be even worse to me. But if my number one priority is to be like Jesus and want to be in God's will, then I say, okay, that's my number one priority. I'd rather be comforted, but since that's my number one priority, I can make it through this because I want to be more like Jesus and he's going to make me more like Jesus through this and he's with me and everything's going to turn out together for good. And I can make it because my number one priority is not my comfort, my well-being, but it's God's will. But the Lord, again, was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. Why? Because now he's in jail. Remember, she had him thrown in jail. Did that mess up God's plans? No. Why? Because God was with him in the jail. He was kind to him in the jail. And he gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there he was responsible for, and the chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's care or charge. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Even the jailer knew that. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Oh, poor Joseph. Things just messed up. God will never be able to use you now. (laughs) Even in the jail, God was with him, making it all work and putting him in charge. And even the chief jailer says, man, all this is working because God's with you. See, God's God. And he's able to work it even in jail in the midst of difficult situations in a man or woman who says, I'm going to obey God above all else. That's all that's important is that I'm obedient to him. And so God just works it out for good because he's being obedient. He learned that for the rewards of obedience. Remember now we see in this situation that now... He called out of prison after a long while to go and interpret a dream of Pharaoh and he interprets it correctly and is able to benefit Pharaoh who's the top of all leaders. He's the head of all of Egypt. And after he did that, then Pharaoh said to his servant, can we find a man like this? That Joseph Joseph guy in whom is a divine spirit. He's a pagan. He doesn't know really how to phrase it. All he knew it was that there was a divine spirit in him. It was some sort of something from a, a God or the God. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God, that's the God, has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. Remember, this is the top guy in all of Egypt, the commander of, in one of the greatest nations of the world, telling this man, this former slave, former prison person, former prison supervisor, you're the wisest man and most discerning man around. How'd he get there, God? He couldn't have got there on his own. And even lost people around him could see God was with him. Because when you're obedient in the fire, even those around you are seeing that God is on your life. See, they watch you when everything's going good. You think, well, I could act like they act when everything's going good. But look how they act when things are going bad. They still are obedient and serve their God. You are so discerning and wise. So there are rewards that come to those that will be obedient. There's also rewards to him who patiently obeyed God in the midst of the fire. You shall be over my house. And according to your command, all my people shall do homage. And he said, they'll bow down before you. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I will set you over all the land of Egypt. You're going to be the top. Nobody will question what you say. You say somebody dies, somebody dies. You say jump, they're only going to say how high. Everything you say is chief business. Nobody will question you. You are number one in command. I'm only the only one over you. And so basically he was vice president of all the country to rule it and reign it and run it however he chose. Wow. From pit to palace, that came pretty quick. But it really didn't. A lot of people said, yeah, but Brother Tim, I've been in this suffering for a while. You know how long it took him to get from pit to palace? Twelve. It took him uh, 12 years. Or 13 years. 13 years of suffering from that pit to the palace. 13 years. But he's willing to to obey. So then he gets the signet ring. He gets the the robe. He gets the gold necklace. He gets the chariot. It's all his. All the power, all the prestige, everything that 
he never had before. All was at his disposal. God's able to do that. But listen, God's not a respecter of persons. He can do it in our life as well. Here's a question. Why did God lead the children of Israel through that wilderness journey? That was so hard on them. You know, they had to wander through the wilderness and suffer. What well, says in Deuteronomy why he did it? To, that he might humble you and that he might test you and that he may do good for you in the end. In the end. Why'd they have to suffer like that? Well, first of all, he had to humble them. So if you haven't got humble in the midst of your difficulty, I think the timer will be reset for your difficulty because you're not ready to take out the oven yet. Because you've got to humble yourself that says, look, I'm not proud anymore. I need God. I need his people. I need fellowship. I need church. I need prayer. I need you. That's humble. I got it. I don't need that church. I don't need people. I need, I'm okay. Look, that's self-sufficiency. That's the key to get out of us. And that difficulty is to rip that out of us and say, I need God. I'm so humble. Without him, I can't do anything. Without his church, without his people, without help from him, I'm a nobody. Because Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. I've got to humble myself. Pride means I'm self-sufficient. Well, once that gets out of you, then he's also going to test you. Why? That's the only way you know when you teach school. Do your children know the answers? Test them. Oh, I'm growing. I'm spiritual. I'm learning. I'm growing in the Lord. Well, let's put you in the fire and let's see. See how you come out of that test. Pass, fail. Fail, let's go through it again. Summer school. Now you have to go through that trial again and again and again and again and again until you can go to the next grade level. You know, the issue through the test was to pass the test so that we can move forward and then grow more and more like Christ. Some of us are still in first grade. We got to get through second and third and the trials are the things that push us each grade level in advance for our spiritual growth. And then the last thing he learned was he learned to forgive those who started this fire. We talked a lot at the retreat about forgiveness because that's a key issue in marriage, but that's a key issue in anything, especially when there are some people responsible probably for part of your fire. As a boss, a company, a, the government, a coworker, a friend, a relative, or somebody you may be blaming that even isn't to blame. But you got to deal with this. You got to deal with what am I going to do with these situations so that I can. Because guess what happens? Now there's a famine in the land. That's what the dream was all about. Now nobody has food. Nobody has substance. And Joseph in his wisdom, we know, was able to come up with a plan of harvesting the grain before the famine showed up so that there'd be plenty of surplus for people now in the midst of the drought and famine to be able to come to Egypt to get their food. And he has been 13 years away from his brother. Now he's in full garb of being the Pharaoh's assistant and probably has makeup and all kind of things and his hair different. And guess who shows up while he's watching people come for grain? The boys, the brothers. And now they're coming for food and he's the one in charge of the food. And if, he, if you're thinking like I'm thinking, if you're in his position, you're thinking, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I'll operate for you in this regard by punishing them, okay? Thank you for giving me this position. And so I'll go out there and say, okay, boys, y'all are going to starve to death because I'm not giving you it. And he had the right also to say, kill all of these men. Kill them all. I mean, he had, all he had, it wasn't like a judge or jury. He was in charge. He'd say, kill, and they're killed within minutes. Or he could say, send them away. Or he could say, don't feed them. But that's not what he did. They come now in a situation where they could really get his revenge. But does he? First of all, his forgiveness sought to restore things to the closest possible relationship. For they were dismayed. King James says, terrified. I think you would be. (laughs) If now when you find out this is our brother and we're in his presence. But what did he say? Come, please come closer to me. And they came closer. See, he wanted them close. Come. 
Come close. Is that what you do with your enemies? Come, come close. Yeah, I want them close, son. Pop them closer. You know? yeah. Closer the better. You can hit harder if they're closer. No, I want them close so I can restore them to the... Cl- yes, sir, Brother Tim, they won't? They won't receive my close invitation. Well, invite it anyway. You can't help what they do. You can help what you do. So that they'll go away saying, well, at least they wanted it closer. I just didn't want it. And God will deal with them. Just let it go. You've already done your part. Second of all, his forgiveness sought to help his brothers forgive themselves. You know, they were feeling awful. Oh my goodness, and look at this. What does he say? Do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sowed me here. Is that how you and I would handle it? (laughs) Some people forgive like this. I forgive you, but do you realize how much you messed up my life? I forgive you, but do you realize the consequences that happened after you did that? I forgive you, but do you remember how hard much that hurt me? I forgive you, but you know what you did? Let me tell you again. I mean, what kind of forgiveness is that? You, you forgive them and then you just kind of give them extra to feel bad about. In other words, I want to forgive you, but I want you to leave feeling worse about it. Come on. Be honest. Shame the devil. Come on. Okay, somebody's done that sometime or another, I hope I do. You know, he's like, hey, I don't want to quite forgive them. I want to kind of semi-forgive them, you know, to make it seem like they don't forget what they did. Because you got to pay. They got to pay a little bit. You just can't let, just drop it all and then go out there living just with no consequence. Yeah, you can. That's what he did. He allowed them to forgive themselves. Hey, don't worry about it. It happened. You did it. I've forgiven you. It's behind. Don't grieve. So leave here with no burden on your heart. Is that how you're going to do it next time? When you got somebody to forgive, just let them also, for them to be able to forgive themselves for what they did to you. And then his forgiveness sought to do good toward them, which helped restore the relationship. What does he say? You, he sent them all to come live near him now. You shall be near me. There I will provide for you. And I'll give you the worst. No, I'm going to give you the best of the land. Wait, hold on just a minute. Joseph, if you're having a time of mental lapse, these are the guys who threw you into prison and you had to suffer for 13 years. Do you remember what they did? Or you have amnesia? This is not how you're supposed to treat people. Not out in the world, but Christians do. Because they're like Christ. And that's how Christ forgives. He forgives us and then loads us up with blessings. And if we're to be Christians, we do the same thing. You did me wrong. A lot of people can't get over it. So Brother Tim, I just, I've forgiven and it's just still eating on me. Okay, do point number three and it'll get rid of that. What's point number three? Go do something good for them. Brother Tim, you got point number four? <laughs> Come on, give me, some, give me some more. Three's no good. Try four or five. You gotta, no, I don't have any more. That's, that's all. That's the only way you're going to get feeling better. I guess I'll stay feeling bad. Well, that's your choice. If you want to be miserable and bitter and angry the rest of your life and have ulcers and, man, go live your life. But if you want to get right, just say, try to do something good. Not just be level ground, go above that ground and do something good for them. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, you come near me. Most people say you get as far away from me as you can. And I'll provide for you. Most people say, I hope you starve. The other people say, I'm going to give you the best. A lot of people say, man, I'm going to give you the worst I got. No, do something good for them. And then you'll say, but they got good now. Yeah, but you'll walk away going, "Woo, freedom sure is nice. Boy, this feels so good. I never knew it'd feel this good. I thought it would be bad, but man, Brother Tim was right. It feels good. That's freedom's better than anything I ever did good for them. It's really good for me. Matter of fact, it's better for me than it was good for them. 
whatever it was, a gift card, a dinner, a gift, I don't know, whatever it was, she'll making you feel good now because you did it God's way. And then lastly, his forgiveness was viewed in light of God's sovereignty. He told those guys, God sent me before you to preserve life. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Now you think, Joseph, have you had another mental lapse? What's going on in the brain cells? Because I think you forgot something. No, the Christian that has a successful life will always know nothing happens in my life without God's permission. And God, Joseph didn't have this verse, but he lived this verse. All things will work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. I'll just put it in God's hands. And so he implemented this verse here saying, it really wasn't you guys doing it. It was God. He was just using you to get me here to this place to save lives and to be top notch in all of Egypt. Amen. He'd just use your enemies to do it. Yeah, but if I obey God, this is going to work out bad. Then he'll use the bad to work out the good. <laughs> he'll get you there through that avenue or any other avenue he chooses, but that's the avenue he chooses is obedience. Amen. Said, hey, it really wasn't you guys. God just works all this thing. It wasn't you sent me, God sent me. God sent me, God sent me, God sent me. Because God all along knew I was going to get here. He just had a little different way of getting me here than what most people would think. His goal was to always get him there. And a lot of people say, you know, I'd be over there for God if all these bad things wouldn't have happened. You know, if I wouldn't have had this upbringing or this wouldn't have happened or I wouldn't have had that and that and that and that, I could be that. Go tell Joseph that in heaven when you run into him one day. So you know why I never could be anything in life? Because all these circumstances. <coughs> Joseph said, that doesn't slow you down. Look where I got. Yeah. It all happened bad, 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 bad. God said, that doesn't matter. I'll just use the bad to get you where I want to go. And the end result was all that mattered. The right perspective. Later on, the brothers still didn't believe they forgave him. They had to come up with a story about their dad after, right before dying said, make sure you, Joseph forgives you. Tell Joseph I want him to forgive. He had already forgiven them. But there in verse, chapter 45, verse 19, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid, for I, am in, I, for I am I in God's place. As for you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. That's where God did it. God did this. God, guys, chill out. You meant for my harm, but God turned it around for his good. And God's God. Whatever circumstance you're going through, God's able to work it out for good and not for evil. We wrap up with this. Family had a young boy, about three years old, and his legs were all crooked. He couldn't even walk. And so they took him to the doctor, and the doctor analyzed it and said, I know he can't walk now, but if you'll put these metal braces on both legs, they got little clamps, and what you'll have to do is squeeze these clamps together each night this much, and within a couple of years, he should be able to walk again because his legs will end up straightening up. Well, the parents did that, but at night, as they turned those little bolts, his little legs had to gradually be pressed, and he would cry and cry and cry. And they, the ones, as they were twisting the little bolts, they were the one causing the tears. Every night, same routine, metal braces, turn and each time they turned, the cries would just get more and more intense. The young child, as young as he was, even knew in his own heart that he hated, began to hate his parents because they were the ones causing him pain. They were deliberately doing it night after night after night after night, causing him pain. After two years of doing that, school was just about ready to start and the braces were taken off about that time and his legs had straightened up them well. And so off he goes to school, walking like all the other boys, playing like all the boys, kickball like all the other boys. All of it turned out together for good. The very person sometimes we blame is God because we know God could stop turning at any moment because he's God. But that little bit of pain was necessary for the end result 
to be what the little boy wanted. That's what God does. Works all out things together for the good. He's our dad. And don't you know, he feels our pain as he is there with us and acquainted, according to the scriptures, Jesus with our grief and our pain, walking through us, but knowing on the other side, the end result, if we stay faithful, is gonna be to our benefit. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet,